Glory to Jesus Christ. Welcome back. You are listening to The Voice of Reason. And on today's episode, I wanted to do a review of a video from Protestant YouTuber Ruslan. Is it Ruslan or Ruslan? Ruslan. Ruslan? 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 Ruslan or Ruslan? Ruslan. Ruslan. Is it? Ruslan. Ruslan. That's how you said it the first time, right? I don't know. I don't know. How does he say it? Ruslan. 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 Okay, really? Let me... Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to The Voice of Reason. And on today's episode, I wanted to do a review of a video from Protestant YouTuber Ruslan. Now, I actually recently did a review of another one of his videos, uh, one in which he's talking about Catholicism and Orthodoxy, and that if he had to choose between the two, which would he choose? If you haven't seen that video, go and check it out. We'll put a link to it somewhere here on the thumbnail, maybe, or maybe in the uh, description below. But go and check that video out, because he made some very interesting comments about the differences between Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And in the video, he says that he leans more towards Orthodoxy over Catholicism. But now in this video that I want to review, it appears that Ruslan has swerved everybody. People were, for some reason, thinking that he was going to convert to Orthodoxy. But uh, he actually recently released a video in which he says that he is not going to convert. He is going to remain a Protestant. He is standing firm in his Protestant convictions. And I wanted to watch it and give my thoughts um, on why he believes Protestantism is true. So let's check it out and see what Ruslan has to say. Why I am not Orthodox, Catholic, Oriental Orthodox, a part of the Armenian Apostolic Church that I grew up in. I I, I, I am not planning to do either uh, any of the above. And that's because I know uh, church history. I've studied church history for a while. I love church history. With all due respect to Ruslan, he does not know church history. That is clear from what I've seen from him. I, I haven't seen much from him, but the few videos from him that I have seen, it is clear that he doesn't know church history. At least not as well as he thinks he knows church history. He has many blind spots. Uh, I think that if he actually did know church history a lot better, he would become either Catholic or go back to Orthodoxy. But yeah, I don't think that we can say that he's a historian. Anyway, let's see what he has to say, though. In my opinion, summarizes the exact reasons why I am not Oriental Orthodox, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East, any of the other streams, why I'm Protestant, why I'm happy to be a Protestant, why I will remain a Protestant. So sorry to burst any of you guys' bubbles. But I think these are important things that most people don't know. They don't know about these things with regarding to Protestantism, and they have straw mans of Protestantism, and they don't know of the historical positions outside of Protestants. So let's get into this. Um, this is from one of my, uh, believe it or not, this is one of my favorite creators. We're working on having him on the channel. This is on the channel Truth Unites. This is Gavin. I talk to him frequently. We actually had a whole offline conversation between me, him, Neil, and, uh, and, and Jonathan Peugeot. He responded to my conversation from Jonathan Peugeot. So Truth Unites, subscribe to, uh, to Gavin. Awesome, 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 awesome channel. And so this is not as a means to dunk on or uh, 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 attack folks in other streams of Christianity. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a means to explain why I'm a Protestant and why I enjoy. So Gavin Orland, I believe, is the very best that Protestantism has to offer, at least on YouTube. I think that Gavin Orland is far up, above and beyond, way ahead of everybody else. I think that he is the best that Protestantism has to offer. But with that being said, Gavin Orland has already been debunked over and over and over and over and over again by a lot of other uh, Catholic YouTubers. Um, people like Trent Horn, Jimmy Aiken, Michael Lofton, uh, Swan Sona, and many other uh, Catholic YouTubers have debunked him over and over and over again. So even though I do think that Gavin Orland makes the best arguments out of all other Protestants, he is also at the same time the most debunked Protestant because he is the very best. A lot of Catholic YouTubers, uh, they focus on responding to him because he presents the best arguments and they have all debunked him over and over and over again. So yeah, Gavin Orland is really good, as good as Protestantism can get, but he's already been proven wrong. But let's see what it is that Gavin Orland says that has persuaded Ruslan to remain Protestant. This is a, a, a means to explain why I'm a Protestant and why I enjoy being a Protestant. 
and uh, and don't plan on. Really quick, he is tried to, to explain why he's a Protestant and why he enjoys being a Protestant. Okay. It's one thing to enjoy being a Protestant, but is that what Christianity is? Is picking what denomination you want to be a part of is just based on what I enjoy or what I prefer or what fits better with me or my lifestyle or my personality or my temperament, whatever it is. Is that really how we decide what church we should belong to? That language that he's using, I don't think it's helpful. I think that it should be, this is why I believe Protestantism is true. It's not because I like it. Who cares what he likes? Who cares what I like? It's about, is Protestantism true or not? That is the question. So, again, it's not about what he enjoys. It's about what is true. Converting to any other stream or jumping ship. Okay, go ahead. Protestantism is a branch of Christianity that traces its origins back to the 16th century Reformation in the Western Church. There are different Protestant traditions, but they share foundational commitments like the five solas, two sacraments, the priesthood of all believers, and many other doctrines. This video is going to suggest three reasons in about five minutes for why it makes sense to be a Protestant Christian. Number one, Protestantism is more Catholic. The word Catholic just refers to the entirety of the church. The major non-Protestant... So what? You... That made no sense. Oh, no, 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 no. Did you guys know that the word Catholic means the entirety of the church? Catholic means universal church, the global church. We don't use that terminology today because Catholic today, in, in our context, we think Roman Catholic church. Whoa. Eastern Orthodox Church calls themselves the Catholic church. And so Catholic means the entirety of the church. And punchline, Protestantism is actually more Catholic than the Roman Catholic church. The major no, no, that's just not true. And Ruslan says this, but then he doesn't go on to explain how Protestantism is more Catholic than the Catholic Church. Uh, but it just isn't true. And in fact, it's demonstrably false. It's uh, demonstrably true that that's not the case. Because there is nothing about Protestantism that is universal. Even within Protestantism itself. Because think about it. In Protestantism, there are literally thousands of denominations. So if Ruslan wants to argue that Protestantism is more Catholic or more universal, the first question is, which brand or which denomination of Protestantism? Because you have thousands of denominations that all believe and teach something different from one another. So the first question is, which denomination of Protestantism is the most Catholic, the most universal? But then, if you were to even just pick one denomination, pick one denomination, and you have to pick just one because, again, even within Protestantism, there is nothing that is universal. Even Sola Scriptura, which is the foundational doctrine of Protestantism, not all Protestants hold the Sola Scriptura. There are many Protestants, especially like high church Protestants like Anglicans, that a lot of them do not hold to Sola Scriptura. So how is Ruslan going to say that Protestantism is more universal when it's not even universal amongst itself and how a foundational doctrine like Sola Scriptura is rejected by many Protestants? Not only that, but other doctrines that are considered to be foundational by many Protestants like Sola Fide, those doctrines are not foundational either. There are other Protestants who say that Calvinism is foundational to Christianity but many Protestants, in fact, I think the majority of Protestants, reject Calvinism. There are many Protestants that will say that eternal security is an essential doctrine of Christianity, but there are many other Protestants that say, no, it isn't. There are many other Protestants that reject the doctrine of eternal security. So again, how is Ruslan going to say that Protestantism is more universal without specifically citing one particular type of Protestantism when there are literally thousands of different types of Protestantism. And the big irony here is that the big Protestant beliefs are not universal at all. So one of the easiest ways to figure out what universal Christianity is, what Catholic Christianity is, is to go into history and look at what these Christians actually believed. What are the teachings, what are the beliefs that Christians held universally throughout the ages? And when you actually go into church history and you read about what the early Christians believed, what the early Christians believed from the time of the apostles up until the Reformation, guess what you're going to find out? All of the distinctive Protestant beliefs were absent 
from Orthodox Christianity. Sola Scriptura cannot be found for the first 1300 years. Sola Fide cannot be found until the revolution in the 16th century. Eternal security cannot be found until John Calvin. All of these Protestant beliefs that are uniquely Protestant, they started in the Middle Ages. So, how can you say that Protestantism is more universal when these Protestant beliefs can't even be found in the church before the Protestant Reformation? So, saying that Protestantism is more Catholic or more universal, it just doesn't work. Let's look at the Patristic Age, for example. During the Patristic Age, which is from the time of the Apostles until the end of the 8th century, we had seven ecumenical councils. And the ecumenical councils are universal councils. The seven ecumenical councils are the perfect way to find out what exactly it was that all Christians believed universally. So if you look at these ecumenical councils, with the first one being uh, Nicaea 1 in the year 325, all the way to the last one, which is Nicaea 2 in the year 787, guess what you do not find? You don't find anything resembling Protestantism. In the seven ecumenical councils, you do not find sola scriptura, you do not find sola fide, you do not find eternal security, you do not find Calvinism, you do not find the 400 years of silence that Protestants made up, you do not find any of those things. So again, to say that Protestantism is more Catholic, more universal than the ancient apostolic faith is just laughable because there is no evidence of this in history. Ruslan just said something that is egregiously false. And he started this video off by saying that he knows church history well. Well, if he knows church history well, shouldn't he know that all of these Protestant beliefs were missing? They're not in the first seven ecumenical councils, so they're, not, they're not in the patristic age. And they're not in any of the other ecumenical councils that happened in the medieval age leading up to the Reformation. They are just not there. So no, Protestantism, no matter which brand of Protestantism you hold to, is not more universal than the universal Catholic faith. Non-Protestant traditions like Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, the Assyrian Church of the East, all claim to be the one true church. Throughout the medieval era, pretty much all the Roman Catholics think that the non-Catholics are damned. Pretty much all the Eastern Orthodox think that the non-Orthodox are damned and so forth. Here's the issue is that is true. You, we can pull up quotes from creeds of all the other churches. The, the issue now is that people have softened on this. Mm. My Eastern Orthodox friends think I'm saved. My Catholic friends think I'm saved. They just think I'm in the wrong church. They've softened on this. The church has softened on this. But historically, their doctrine has been that the other streams of the church are damned. You're not truly saved unless you're Eastern Orthodox. You're not truly saved unless you're Catholic. That has shifted recently. That has shifted a lot recently. But it's shifted towards a Protestant perspective. Let's let, let's let uh, Gavin cook. So again, what he just said in this part of the video shows that he has a very shallow and superficial understanding of what these churches, these apostolic churches, actually teach today. I wonder if Ruslan knows that the Catholic doctrine of there is no salvation outside the church is still believed by the Catholic church today. It has not changed. We have not softened on it. It's still a Catholic belief. What the Catholic Church taught at the Council of Florence, what the Catholic Church taught at the Council of Trent, matches with what the Catholic Church taught in Vatican I and Vatican II. A lot of people don't know that Vatican II affirms that position that outside of the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. So what the Catholic Church teaches is that uh, while there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, what that means is that if there is anybody that during their lifetime uh, was not a visible member of the Catholic Church, but when they died, they ended up being saved, they ended up making it to heaven, what that means is that they actually were in union with the Catholic Church in an imperfect way. Because we know that Jesus Christ saves us through His Church. So yeah, even if you're not a member of the Catholic Church uh, explicitly, even if you're not a formal member of the Catholic Church, if you die and it turns out that you are saved and you're going to make it to heaven, you were actually saved through the Church. So yes, there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, but that doesn't mean that you have to be an explicit, formal, visible member of the Church to be saved. If you're not Catholic and you die and it turns out you're saved, you were not saved because you were Orthodox. 
You were not saved because you were a Protestant. You were not saved because you were a Muslim. You were not saved because you were an atheist. You were saved in spite of all of those things, and you were saved through the Catholic Church. So that is the nuanced teaching of the Catholic Church that I'm sure Ruslan was not aware of. It, the Catholic Church has not changed its position. It has maintained the same thing from the very beginning. Protestants would like to argue that the language that was used by the Catholic Church at the councils of Florence and Trent is so different from the language that is used by the Catholic Church at Vatican I and at Vatican II. Now, the language is different, but it's not because the Catholic Church is teaching different doctrines, right? Uh, the Catholic Church didn't teach one thing at the Councils of Florence and Trent, and then another thing at Vatican I and Vatican II. The Catholic Church taught the same thing. The difference in language is because of who was being addressed. Think about it. The Council of Florence was addressing Orthodox who refused to come into communion with Rome. This was in the 15th century. The language of the Council of Florence is addressing those Orthodox Christians that were there, that were present, that knew the Catholic position and still rejected it. The language that the Catholic Church used at the Council of Trent was used specifically for the original Protestant reformers, the ones who were there, the ones who were present, the ones who knew what the Catholic position was and still refused to come back in to communion with the church. The language of Vatican II is so different because Vatican II isn't addressing the original Protestant reformers who knew better and were actively protesting the Catholic Church. The language of Vatican II is different because it is addressing uh, people who are descendants of the, of the Protestant reformers 400 years later. Think about it. Trent is addressing uh, the original Protestants the Protestants who should have known better who left the church, Vatican II is addressing people that were born 400 years later that are in a completely different context than the original reformers. The original reformers should have known better, but Protestants that are born 400 years later uh, in the 20th century when Vatican II happened, they don't know better because they were born into Protestantism. They weren't actively separating themselves from the Catholic Church. They were just born into the Protestant tradition. So that's why the language is different. Because Trent was addressing the original Protestants. Vatican II is addressing people that were not there. Vatican II is addressing a different people 400 years after the fact. The Catholic Church isn't going to address Protestants of today who were born into Protestantism in the same way that they addressed the original Protestant reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin. That's why the language is different. Not because the Catholic Church is changing its positions, it's addressing different people. Let's let uh, Gavin Cook. Into the highest levels of magisterial teaching. By contrast, Protestantism doesn't restrict the church to one institution. In the 19th century, the historian Philip Schaff argued for a vision of Protestantism as an organic renewal effort within the one true church. He called Protestantism the principle of movement, of progress in the history of the church, and spoke of its Catholic union with the past, insisting that the Protestant traditions have fundamental points of continuity with traditions outside Protestantism. People are often surprised to discover that this is how the reformers thought. Luther said, in the papacy there is true Christianity, even the right kind of Christianity, and many great and devoted saints. The Christendom that is now under the papacy is truly the body of Christ and a member of it. That's crazy. Luther, who led the Protestant Reformation, is saying, I still think that God is in the Catholic Church. Whoa. That's crazy. This is uh, another quote from John Calvin. When we categorically deny the papists the title of the church, we do not, for this reason, impunge the existence of churches among them. So both John Calvin and Martin Luther said that the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, still has churches, godly churches within them, even though we deny them the superiority as the one and only true church. It's interesting, isn't it? Go ahead. It's interesting, but let me tell you why that actually doesn't make sense. So Gavin Orland says in his video that Protestantism doesn't limit the church to one institution. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that any church that claims to be a Protestant church is a valid, true Christian church? If the answer is yes, well, now you have a conundrum. Now you have an even bigger issue 
Because again, you have all of these different Protestant churches, thousands of them, maybe tens of thousands of them, that all teach something different. They all believe something different. And this is about matters that are essential to the faith. Uh, again, there are Protestants that will say that Calvinism is essential to the faith, and that if you're not a Calvinist, then you're not a Christian. There are other Christians that say that baptismal regeneration is essential to the faith, and if you don't believe in baptismal regeneration, you are not a Christian. There are Protestant Christians that deny the Trinity. Can you be a Protestant Christian and deny the Trinity and still be a true Christian and be part of a true church? Are oneness Pentecostals part of the true church? See, this idea that oh, Protestantism doesn't limit the church to just one institution, then what that does is that actually divides Christ's church into all of these different competing belief systems. And we know that Christ's true church cannot be divided into competing belief systems. We know that Christ's true church is one, is holy, is apostolic, and is Catholic, meaning universal. So the Catholic position actually makes a lot more sense that the Catholic Church, the church that Jesus Christ founded, is the one true church, is uh, the one institutional church, and there can be people outside of that institutional church that have an imperfect or informal union with the one true church. That actually makes a lot more sense than just saying, oh, any church that has the title of Protestant, it's good. Oh, and by the way, there are many Protestants that will say that the Catholic Church is the true church. There are many Protestants that will say that the Orthodox Church is the true church. But there are also many other Protestants that will say that the Catholic Church is not a true church and that Catholics are not true Christians. There are many Protestants that will say that the Orthodox is not a true church and that Orthodox Christians are not true Christians. So there's a division within Protestantism over who's a Christian and who isn't. So that is a big problem. Um, so that idea that, oh, you know, the one true church can be made up of all of these different churches, different institutions, that divides the church and makes the church of Jesus Christ uh, contradictory within itself. And we know that we can't have that because the Holy Scripture tells us that God is not the author of confusion, and we know that the church is a divine institution. The true church of Jesus Christ is not confused. The true church of Jesus Christ is united, is one. When we categorically deny to the papists the title of the church, we do not for this reason impugn the existence of churches among them. Similarly, both Calvin and Luther defended the ecclesial status of Eastern Orthodoxy against Roman Catholic claims of exclusivity. For example, Calvin said, they make the Greeks schismatics. With what right? Because in withdrawing from the apostolic see, they lost their privilege. What? Would not they who fall away from Christ deserve to lose it much more? Compare those. And John Calvin saying this, he's starting off from a faulty ecclesiology. He doesn't understand that to fall away from the church is to fall away from Christ. It's not possible that you can remain uh, united to Christ, but fall away from his church, that you can leave this church and still be united to Christ. That's not possible. Uh, you can't have Jesus without his church. And that's something that John Calvin didn't believe in, he didn't understand, John Calvin was wrong. Pair those statements with the pre-modern ways of thinking in the non-Protestant traditions, and you get two fundamentally different ways of construing Catholicity. Bottom line, if you are opposed to shrinking the church down to one institution, you should probably be a Protestant. This isn't just in Catholics not thinking Orthodox folks are saved, Orthodox folks not thinking, right? This isn't just there. This also, unfortunately, bleeds into certain fundamentalist Protestant camps, meaning that there are certain fundamentalist Protestants, fundamentalist Baptists, independent Baptists, who think only their true, only their little circle is the true church. Yeah. So this isn't just exclusive, but it is in, in Mad. So Ruslan right there, he just pointed out that even though Gavin Nordland is saying that Protestantism doesn't reduce the church to just one institution. Ruslan is pointing out that there are Protestants that do reduce the church to their particular denomination. So again, that is an inconsistency within Protestantism. In, in magisterial teaching of Catholics and Orthodox, that they believe they're the one true church and that everyone outside of that is a math anathema. Anyone that doesn't uh, uh, agree to the same creeds, uh, Nicaea, Nicaea two for example, is when they started venerating saints, all that kind of stuff, they're damned. Yeah. That it makes sense for the Catholic Church to say that it's the one true church. It makes sense for the Orthodox churches to all say that they're the one true church. But what doesn't make sense is for Protestants to say, 
Yeah, there are people within Protestantism that are part of the true church. There are people even outside of Protestantism that are part of the true church. And all of these different denominations that all have fundamentally different teachings, they're all somehow, some way, still part of the true church, even though that they're not united in belief, worship, and governance. And those three things are essential to the true church. The true church has to be one in belief, in governance, and in worship. But all of these churches, and just within Protestantism alone, not even talking about the apostolic churches, they are not united in any of those things. So, it seems like Gavin Orland is arguing for a divided church. And again, Scripture says that the, the body of Christ cannot be divided. That is why the apostolic churches are so insistent on claiming that uh, the apostolic churches, each of them individually, are the true church because the church of Jesus Christ can be divided. That's been changed, but it's still pervasive in uh, some Protestant circles as well. Just to be fair, go ahead. Protestantism has a more realistic and compelling relation to church history. Cardinal Newman famously said, to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. Mm. And to be sure, many contemporary Protestants do have a shallow historical consciousness. Which is unfortunate. But Protestantism as such. The irony of Ruslan saying it's unfortunate, he's right, it's unfortunate, but the irony is that he himself has a shallow understanding of history too, like Gavin Olin said. So, yeah, awkward. Was nothing other than an effort of historical retrieval. The magisterial reformers appealed to the church fathers just as much and sometimes more than they appealed to scripture to oppose what they saw as the novel accretions and innovations of the medieval West. Things like the following seven examples. Number one, the financially abusive system of salvation involving indulgences, the treasury of merit, masses for the dead to reduce time in purgatory, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Number two, transubstantiation as the required mechanism for real presence in the Eucharist. Number three, papal infallibility. Number four, that the number of sacraments is seven. Number five, cultic practices like the veneration of icons. Number six, withholding communion in both kinds, that is, in both bread and wine from the laity. Number seven, the elaborate role assigned to Mary in the piety mm -hmm. and dogma of the church. The, the issues he's presenting here are all medieval issues that sprouted up. Mm -hmm. so Every single thing that Gavin Orland presented right here in this part of his video, all of those things you find in the patristic age. Every single one of them is found in the patristic age. If it's in the patristic age, it's fair game. So Ruslan just said that all of these things uh, began in the medieval age, and that's just not true. Everything that was just listed, you can find in the patristic age, in the first 800 years. So again, Protestants, all of us, we need to do a lot better at actually reading and studying church history and what was actually believed by the Christians in the patristic age. Mm -hmm. So they're all issues that came up later in the church the indulgences yeah. that's what a lot of luther's issue was the veneration of, of of icons really quick the indulgence thing indulgences did not sprout out in the medieval times the controversy with martin luther and indulgences um that was actually a legitimate abuse of certain people within the church that were selling indulgences that's the part that they leave out it wasn't that indulgences came out of nowhere it was the selling of indulgences that was the controversy. That's the part that they kind of leave out. The Catholic Church has never taught that indulgences are to be sold. And indulgences themselves are not something that sprung up in the medieval ages. You can find indulgences which are just satisfactions for temporal guilt in the patristic age as well. Icons, they would say that they don't worship them, but almost seemingly seeing people kiss pictures of icons yeah. and bow to them. It's kind of, kind of, kind of weird. Right, especially okay. as a Protestant, and so all maybe it's weird for a Protestant, but Ruslan, if you know church history, it shouldn't be weird for you, right? If you've read the Patr the Patristic Age, seeing Catholics and Orthodox venerate images, that shouldn't be weird for you, especially if you know early church history. Do you know early church history? If you did, that wouldn't be so weird to you. But you're saying it's weird. So which is it? Do you know church history or do you not know church history? And so all of this was not with the early church fathers' practice. This is not the first 300, 400 years of the church. First of all, the patristic age isn't the first three or 400 years of the church. It's the first 800 years. The patristic age ends at the end of the 8th century. The patristic age ends with St. John of Damascus. He is the last early church father. 
And this is something that I notice that a lot of Protestants like to do. Um, when they talk about the early church, they talk about the early church as it being the only the first 300, maybe 400 years. They leave out half of the patristic age. That's another huge problem. They are arbitrarily cutting it off halfway through. This all came later, right? This all came later. M most of it specifically. I mean, there's some language with the early church fathers regarding uh, Mary being viewed as the mother of God, but all the other stuff came way, 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 way later. And so that, that, is, that is what he's getting at. None of those issues has a solid basis in patristic Christianity. Now, to be clear, church history is complicated. It doesn't neatly or consistently serve as... Maybe I will do a video, a follow-up to this video, where I show everything that Gavin Orton outlines in this video and show where it is all found in the patristic age of church history. ...serve as a support to any one side in the current debates. Mm -hmm. But Protestants can simply accept that messiness because tradition is not for us an infallible guide. That leads to the third point. Protestantism... Oh, the, meaning, meaning that I can affirm the earlier creeds, but I cannot affirm the later creeds. I can't affirm Nicaea too. I can't affirm papal infallibility. I can't, and, and papal infallibility is like 250 years old. Mm -hmm. you, you know, he just said that papal infallibility is 250 years old. Again, Ruslan doesn't know church history. If he thinks that papal infallibility was invented 250 years ago, he needs to stop commenting about anything having to do with apostolic Christianity, and he needs to go back to the early church, the first 800 years, and read it, because he is going to be shocked when he finds out that papal infallibility was actually believed from the very beginning. You can actually find it going back to as early as St. Irenaeus of Lyon in the second century. No, it wasn't invented 250 years ago, and anyone who says such a thing just proves that they have no idea what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So a lot of these creeds came later, a lot of these statements came later um, that, that just aren't in the first couple hundred years of the church, right? They're not a part of the um, the first Nicene Council, they're they're later. And so, uh, and I can acknowledge that. So is he cutting it off at Nicaea 1? Is Nicaea 1 where it cuts off? Anything after Nicaea 1 we can just discard? Um, that's arbitrary. Why? Why is he limiting it to just Nicaea 1? Uh, from the, the church has, even in the medieval times, everyone understood up until just very recently with these online Protestants, they all understood that the patristic age ends with St. John of Damascus at the end of the 8th century, not with Nicaea 1 in 325. Again, it's an arbitrary cutoff point that <clears throat> Protestants are using. And the reason that they do it, by the way, the reason that they like to cut off the uh, patristic age in the 4th century is because in the middle of the 4th century and into the 5th century is where all of this stuff that they reject uh, where you see explicitly. So they have to cut it off right before, like around the year 431, like around the Council of Ephesus. <clears throat> the Council of Ephesus, that's where they cut it off. They cut it off at 430. So they are literally cutting the patristic age in half. And the reason they do that is because in 430, around that time, is when all of this Catholic and Orthodox uh, theology and all of these uh, doctrines that are held by the Catholic and Orthodox churches, that is where they are found all over the place. They are, the, the patristic age is just flooded with all of these beliefs, so they have to just push it back uh, to, you know, the 4th century. Because if they admit that the patristic age ends at the end of the 8th century, then they have to admit that all of these Catholic and Orthodox beliefs were present in the early church. And I can acknowledge that there's certain things that are just, that are messy. And, and, and I can acknowledge that Luther got it wrong on certain things. Mm. I can acknowledge that Calvin got it wrong on certain things. That's, that's the flexibility that's allowed is that no one creed is superior to scripture, which is what he's going to get into next. Places Holy Scripture over the authority of the church. This does not mean that we reject tradition wholesale, mm -hmm. but it does put Scripture in a unique position of paramount authority because we recognize that only the words of Scripture are God breathed, carried along by the Holy Spirit, the oracles of God. Jesus. And all of those things are agreed upon by the Catholic and Orthodox churches. We agree that the Holy Scriptures are the only thing that we have that are God breathed. We agree that the Holy Scriptures are the only thing that we have that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's something that Vatican II affirms uh, in its document, for example, uh, uh, Dei Verbum, on the Word of God. It says that the Catholic Church actually teaches that the Bible is above everything else. The Catholic Church teaches that. 
but that that isn't Sola Scriptura. So um, they do like a bait and switch where they will list all of these things about the Bible, that the Bible is the only thing that is inspired, but that doesn't mean that Sola Scriptura is true. Just because the Bible is the only thing that is inspired by the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that the Bible is the only infallible authority. So you have to be really careful because they will do this uh, bait and switch. Um, but you have to listen closely to be able to spot it. Jesus quoted the Old Testament as God speaking and warned against elevating tradition to a role that nullifies the That's Word right. of God. And the traditions of the Catholic and Orthodox churches don't nullify the Word of God. To put it simply, we as the church have no rule of faith that is comparable in authority to the very words of God that we have in Scripture. Protestantism makes sense because it keeps that authority uppermost and thereby keeps us accountable to the apostolic deposit. To sum up, Protestantism is... And guess who else believes that? The Catholic Church believes that because the Catholic Church teaches that in Vatican II. Protestantism makes sense because it keeps that authority uppermost and thereby keeps us accountable to the apostolic deposit. It actually doesn't because the Bible actually attests to the church being an infallible authority as well. So Protestants want to say we follow the Bible and the Bible alone, but the Bible says to follow a tradition and to follow the church. So if you're following the Bible alone, that means that you're also following tradition and the church because the Bible alone attests to tradition and the church being an infallible authority. So what that means is that it's impossible to follow the Bible alone according to the Bible. Yet that's what Protestants do, and that's why Protestantism is false. To sum up, Protestantism is, first, a renewal within the church, second, a removal of historical accretions, and third, a return to the authority of Scripture. And all of those things are false. It's not a return to the authority of Scripture because it's ignoring everything that Scripture says about the authority of the church that Christ established, and Protestantism didn't remove anything. Protestantism itself actually is the accretion. All of the Protestant doctrines, all of the uniquely Protestant doctrines are accretions that are not found before the Protestant Reformation. It makes sense to be a Protestant because it has a more compelling appeal to Catholicity, history, and scripture. No, it doesn't because Protestantism is not Catholic, meaning it's not universal. Protestantism is not historical because, again, you can't find these Protestant beliefs in history. And Protestantism is not scriptural because scripture points to not only itself, but also to tradition and to the church as infallible rules of faith. So Protestantism fails. Let's go. Because. Shout out to uh, Truth Unites. So that, was great. that is why, ladies and gentlemen, I am a Protestant is because... I see God moving in all streams of Christianity, right? Not necessarily all churches. I see the history of the church is messy and complicated, and I'm capable of rejecting aspects of some of Luther's views or some of whoever's views, because ultimately Scripture is my final authority. I still have other authorities. I still uh, I, I affirm some of the early creeds. I affirm some of those things, but church history is not of equal authority with Scripture from, from my paradigm. And the Catholic Church doesn't teach that church history is on equal authority with Scripture. So again, this is a straw man that Ruslan is uh, presenting. And um, he's right that church history is messy, but uh, Protestantism actually makes that church history a whole lot messier. The only tradition that actually makes sense of all of church history in totality is the Catholic tradition. The Catholic teachings, the Catholic Church, makes full sense, makes complete sense of everything that we see in church history, and only the Catholic Church. So, yeah, um, Rusla needs to do better, Gavin Orla needs to do better, and if they want to debate, I love to do debates. So, Rusla, if you want to have a debate, let's have a debate. I don't know if Rusla debates, but I know that Dr. Gavin Orla debates, so Dr. Gavin Orla, if you'd like to have a debate, let me know. Glory to Jesus Christ.